Let's pray. Father, I come this morning thanking you and praising you for this new year and opportunities that you give us. I ask, Father, that you use me in the next few minutes, that you strip everything away. and Father, just use me in truth and spirit this morning to bring your message, bring your word. I give you, Father, the honor and the glory for everything's accomplished and pray and ask this in Jesus' name. The scriptures are on the pews next to you. And, uh, this message this morning, this teaching this morning, is one that a lot of people don't like <clears throat> because we don't like the term of commitment. When I started looking at the new year and I started to pray about what I should teach this morning, uh, the word commitment came to me and I began to pray about it and the Holy Spirit started showing me and guiding me to what we as a church should be seeking after and I realized that God desires our total commitment. And, and I realized too that we live in a society that shuns commitment. And if you look around, you see that. Uh, the one thing that's missing I believe in our society today is commitment. There's no commitment in marriage, there's no commitment to country, there's no commitment to anything anymore. Uh, we are all taught through political government and all this kind of thing that uh, we should be individuals and we should relish the individual. Well, the problem with that is if I'm only committed to myself, I run into lots of issues because I live with other people. I live with other situations that are going on around me. So I have to be committed to a lot of different things. If I'm not committed to my marriage, my marriage is not going to work. If I'm not committed to my family, my family is not going to work. <clears throat> if I'm not committed to my church, my church is not going to work. If I'm not committed to my God, my God is not going to work in my life. Bottom line. It's just not going to happen. So I thought as I prayed about this that what does the Bible say about commitment? And that's where we want to go this morning. We want to look at what the Bible has to say about commitment. There's a lot of references in the Bible talking about commitment and what the Christian commitment should be. In many very different aspects of life as, as we look at this, there's commitment to our families, our neighbors, our employers, our church, our health. There's all sorts of things that the Bible covers. So we're going to look at some of this, and I want to stress some of these things as we look at them. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6 and look at verse 5. This verse says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of, of your heart, as unto Christ. Now, <clears throat> as I read that, I realized that in our society today that the word servant, the words master, all these things are not accepted. And part of the problem is that we don't try to understand what it's actually talking about. We immediately take offense to what it actually, what the words actually are. So what is it talking about, servants and masters? Uh, it's not that we should be afraid of people, <clears throat> but we should have respect for those who are in authority over us. So who has authority over us? And we start to look at that. It's those people that God has ordained to place in authority. Bosses at work teachers at church, police officers, different people, the court system, all those things are ordained by God. Now, there may be some corrupt people that hold some of those positions, but God will deal with that. We don't have to worry about that. What we should have is commitment to those positions, commitment to that authority that's over our lives. And whether we like it or not, we have authorities that are over our lives. We always want to put a political spin on everything. 
we always want to look at the the now here and now kind of political aspect to everything, but look at it the way God looks at it. If God ordains the authority that's over your life, and that goes down to husbands and wives in marriages, that goes down to fathers over children, that goes down to a lot of different things. But if we don't respect that, all of those units are going to break down. They're not going to be able to function the way that God intends for them to function. Because as in a marriage, the husband is to be the head of the wife because he is supposed to be the spiritual head of the family. If that doesn't happen, then the wife winds up having to take that responsibility. We'll work. That spiritual wife can be the spiritual head of that family, but it's not the way God intended it to be, and it's never going to be as easy. So that husband must be that part of that family that God has ordained to be the spiritual authority of that family. <clears throat> now, we get all tore up about that today. We don't like to talk about one being an authority over, of, over the other. But understand that this is the way God set things up. And this is the way God works. And we need to pay attention to what God has to say about these. Understand the things that are ordained by God are the things of God. And if we choose to ignore those things because we don't think that way or we don't want to believe that way or I don't, ha I don't want anyone in authority over me, then we're going to have a hard time a very hard time because we'll never be able to receive what God has done for us. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I started thinking about this and the, the commitment to assembly. In our society today, because of recent events that have happened in our world over the last two, two and a half years, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but the attack on the assembly of the people of God has been great, tremendously great, to the point to where some cities even banned the meetings of churches during the COVID episode. So we, as churches, we began to put things together trying to function, trying to operate, and a lot of them were doing it so that the money would continue to come in. So they started go, doing live streaming. They started doing posting uh, messages on the Internet, doing different things. But the problem with that is it wound up taking the place of the assemblage of the church. And as much as you want to try, you can't, do what God intends for the church to do when we don't come together. When we come together, we come together to exhort one another. We come together to lift one another up. We come together to help one another. We come together as individuals who are born again. That, that's the other thing. You know, so many people think the church is for the lost. The church is not for the lost. The church is for the saved. Church is for those people who are filled with the Holy Ghost. The church is for those people who bring the Spirit of God together. When we bring the Spirit of God together, I don't care how many of us are, it doesn't matter. When we bring that Spirit of God together, we commune with one another through that Spirit, and the power of God is here. So when we lift one another up, we exhort one another, and we bear one another's problems, and we carry one another's burdens that's important. That commitment has got to be a strong commitment in our lives because that is what the church is all about. And a lot of people argue, though, the church is about saving people. No, that's wrong. The church is about the saved people. Then you go out into the byways and the highways and you, you find those people who are lost and you bring them. You share Jesus Christ with them. You share that spirit that's inside of you. 
We should never, never forsake the assemblage of ourselves together. And it's important when we read this as the day of the Lord is approaching. And we've talked a lot about this in our study in Revelation. We talked about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is judgment. The day of the Lord is end times. A lot of different terms that define the day of the Lord. But if you can't look around after studying Revelation, if you can't look around and see that we are definitely in the end times, we're definitely upon the day of the Lord. We need to be lifting one another up and encouraging one another during this time because it gets harder for the world as the closer we get to the day of the Lord. It's not going to get easier. And I don't say that to scare you or to press you into anything. I'm telling you that so that what you have on the inside of you is power, is light in a very dark place. Let that light shine in a very dark place. And those who are around us will see the light. And you'll be able to share what you have with those that are not saved. That's the way salvation is shared. It's not necessarily shared in a church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. So, talking about commitment, what is it telling us? If we are born again, our bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost. You house one of the most powerful things in the universe, the Spirit of God. Think about it for a moment. Just think about what God has given you as a born-again believer. Everyone who is here is a temple. And in that temple is the Spirit of God Almighty, God of the universe. And when we come together, the power of God comes in each one of us. Verse 19 tells us that we don't have the right to deny the body, the body is the church, of this because the temple is not our own. Now, a lot of people, again, take exception to that. My body is mine, and I can do what I want to with my body. No, if you're born again, your body belongs to God. It is a temple to God. It has the Spirit of God on the inside of it. It is not yours to do with as you would please. It belongs to God. So commitment means committing your body, your temple, to what God intends for that temple to be used for. That temple is to be used to show the world the God that we serve. <clears throat> Every fiber of our being Every facet of our life must be committed to loving and serving God. This means that we hold nothing back from God. And the question comes, why? Why, why have I got to be that committed to God? Because he's that committed to you. He's so committed to you that he's given you everything even his only begotten son. If we place God first over everything else in our lives, our lives become peaceful. They become meaningful. If we don't, they become full of turmoil, stress, Hardship, questioning. 
and John chapter 3. Very familiar scripture, but I wanted to read this this morning because it's important. Starting in verse 14 in John chapter 3, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever uh, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, and they are wrought in God. I hope you can, it comes down to verses 20 and 21. If, and you know them, you've met them before, those people who are just evil. There's no light in them. It's only darkness. We've all had to deal with them. But you can immediately pick up on them. But you've also met the one who carries the light. And you immediately see who that person is. The world can see it also. The world can see the light also. Jesus himself, who is speaking this, made it very clear what was given for us and why he was given it's a gift. It's not earned. It's not purchased. But it's a free gift from God. <clears throat> and it's a free gift from God the Father. Remember, we've talked about God the Father. That's love. And this free gift is given out of the love of God. In all our commitment to God, the most important is this understanding of the light. Look at what Jesus told those who would like to follow him. Now, I, I want you just to imagine, during Jesus' time, he was walking the earth. He had disciples following him, of course, but the crowds began to follow him. Why? Because they watched him do the miracles, they watched him do miraculous things. They watched him do things that they didn't understand. So they were following him and hoping to get a glimpse, get an answer, be able to ask him something, be able just to be close to him. Why were they following him so close? Because it was just a thing to do. Everybody who, who had heard of Jesus wanted to be close to him, wanted to see what he was doing. Couldn't believe what I heard Jesus was doing. I want to see it for myself. Look in Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, what Jesus actually says. He says, if any man come to me. <clears throat> now, he's addressing this crowd that's following him. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people will read that and they're finished. They're not going to go any further because what in the world does it mean when Jesus says you got to hate your mother and your father and your sisters and your brothers and you got to hate everybody to be able to follow. That's not what he's saying. Read what he says. What did Jesus mean when he said this? And remember the crowd that's following him. The crowd that's following him is following him for the wrong reasons. They're following him for the thrill of the moment. 
It doesn't mean that we follow Jesus, we immediately have to hate our families. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that if we commit to following Jesus, and I'm talking about full-fledged commitment, to the point to where he's not just Jesus Christ anymore, but he is Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's the difference between Jesus Christ and Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ means he's the Lord over your life. That means you're totally committed. If you're totally committed, then there are going to come times in your family, in your relationships with other people, where your commitment to Jesus Christ is going to be a problem. And you're going to have to make a decision. It's going to be an either or. Am I going to stay with my family that don't agree with my commitment to Jesus Christ or am I going to stay with my commitment to Jesus Christ? <clears throat> That's what he's talking about. When the day comes when your family says, well, you, you believe in Jesus Christ more than you believe in your family. How do you answer that? How do you answer that? The only way you can answer it if you are totally committed is Jesus Christ. And hope your family can see Jesus Christ through you. Because that's what it's all about. But don't think you'll never run into that either or situation. You will. And the more committed you become, the more likely you are to run into the situation. Just be prepared. Just to know. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. And we're going to start in verse 51. And some more hard things that Jesus said just to read them. But let's understand what he's actually talking about. Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. I always think it's, it's kind of funny. You know, at Christmas, we always talk about the birth of the baby brought peace on earth. No, it didn't. Where's the peace if it brought peace on earth? The only peace that it brought was peace between God and man. That's what Jesus Christ is. He is peace between God and man. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. Verse 52, for <clears throat> from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. And the father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, and the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, and the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What's he talking about? When one in the house becomes a Christian, they're divided from the rest of the ones who are not Christians. When another one becomes a Christian, they're divided from the rest of them because of their commitment to God through Jesus Christ. Understand this is a real problem in the world today. And if you've never faced this, you will. Eventually you will. And I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you be prepared in your commitment to God. Because your commitment is more than just words out of your mouth. It is your actions. Bottom line is we can't make that kind of commitment. We can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Jesus is warning us in advance of becoming his disciple. He's like, do you really want to do this? Is this really what you want to do? He's not trying to coat it over and make it look nice and make it look good. Remember, he over and over, he tells us there is a burden. <clears throat> there is issues with commitment to Jesus Christ as far as the world is concerned. But 
the advantage of the commitment to Jesus Christ and the life in Jesus Christ committed to God is miles ahead of anything that the world has to offer. Because all the world can offer is sin, heartbreak, fear, death, <clears throat> all the things that we see going on in the world. When we come down to John chapter 15, look at verses 18 through 20. If the world hates you, how many of you know that there are people in this world that hate you because you're a Christian? You may have run into some of them before. I have. Not because of who you are or, or what you said or what you do or anything like that, just because you're a Christian. They hate you. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the world that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. Now he's talking to his disciples, but he's talking to us because we're disciples also. We're the ones who are supposed to be going out into the highways and the byways, and we're supposed to be the ones who are sharing Jesus Christ. But if we're not fully committed, we don't have anything to share because all we're going to share is the world. But this is a very strong warning from Jesus himself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 12 through 14, Paul wrote this. He said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I think Paul is, <clears throat> as far as men are concerned, is one of the people who could speak to persecution more than anyone else could. In verse 13 he says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He says it's not going to get any better. In verse 14, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul says, it's not going to get any better. The world is dying. The world's getting worse. And just because we're the light of God in this dying world doesn't mean that we're going to be in this great little sphere of uh, everything's great, utopia, that's not going to happen. Paul says it's going to be worse. The world is going to come against you. The world is going to attack you. The world is going to accuse you. The world is going to tell you how stupid you are, how silly you are, how narrow-minded you are. All these different things. You just smile at the world and keep on believing. Keep your commitment to God. Because there is salvation. Jesus made it plain And he told his disciples very plainly in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, he said this, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. What's he saying? What about taking up his cross? I've, I've heard so many things preached on this, so many things taught on this that's, that, that are ridiculous. What's he saying? If you take up the commitment, if you take the commitment to God and you pick up that commitment and you carry that commitment regardless of what comes against you, you're denying yourself with your commitment to God. And this is not just something you do on Sunday. This is something you do every day. And he talks about saving your life. 
if I jump off my commitment in order to make everything great for me, and then I jump back on my commitment later on, it's not going to work. That's what he's talking about. But he says, whosoever shall lose his life. In other words, if I can put myself away and I can only focus on God through Jesus Christ. It's not about me. It's all about him. So don't put the focus on me. Put the focus on him. That's what he's talking about. The true cost of total commitment is self-denial. And I think that's one of the things that we struggle with more than anything else is denying oneself. Because our self, our soul, likes to tell us all the things that are wrong and all the things that we need to do and all the things that, that need to be corrected to please self, to please the soul. Allow the spirit to take control. In Romans chapter 5, verse 11, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When I start feeling pity for myself because of circumstances, this is where you want to go. What did God do for me? Here's what he did for me. Christ died for us. <clears throat> he died for me. He died for you. He died for each one of us. And if we had been the only one, he would have still died for us. God the Father sacrifices greatly for us to be able to place ourselves in total commitment to him. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to save his life, a ransom for many. Paul wrote that again later on in Scripture. It is Matthew has written it here. He talks about the Son of Man came not as God. He came as a servant. Not to be ministered to, but to minister to those who are around him. That's our example. That's what we're supposed to be. That's our commitment. We're supposed to be committed to ministering to those around us who are less fortunate. Those who are less fortunate are those who do not have Jesus Christ in their life. Total commitment to God means that we can truly claim Jesus Christ Lord over our lives. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul wrote, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I know live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul has a way of stating things very simply, but very to the point. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, he wrote, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He's not necessarily talking about a physical death. He's talking about dying to self. Being able to put ourself down and focus on the things of God. Commitment is a process. <clears throat> it's a process of faith, grace, learning and living the life of a true born-again believer. So if you find yourself sometimes slipping in commitment, just understand you're in a process. You're in a growth process. That growth process brings you to that commitment. I don't think this is the level of commitment that anyone can just say one day I'm totally committed. I think you have to grow into this commitment. But as long as you're moving forward and you're growing into this commitment, 
God is excited and God is going to be there with you and he's going to be, be supplying you with everything you need for that growth. You're going to hear the right words. You're going to read the right scriptures. You're going to see the things that you need to see. And God's going to bring you to that place to be fully and totally committed. It's one thing to be recognized by the world for all the great things that we've done. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's something else to be recognized by God for the commitment that we have to him. And that's where we want to be. We want to be totally committed, serving our Lord, Jesus Christ. Because then there's no question about our motive, why we're here, what we're doing, how can we do this. It's all about him. It's not about me. Can we stand, please? As you look forward to this new year, and you start thinking about, I, you know, I, I thought about what does New Year's usually mean to most people, and usually it's resolutions. Everybody, what, what do you think the number one resolution for everyone in, in the new year is? <clears throat> Lose weight. <laughs> That's the number one resolution for everybody across the whole Galaxy. Everyone wants to lose weight. That's the number one resolution. How many people lose weight? Very few. Uh, <clears throat> so I started thinking about what, what is, what's a good resolution for the new year? What, how can we change our thinking and really gain something as far as a resolution is concerned? Well, resolution is commitment. I want to be totally committed to God. I want to be totally committed to a God that loves me. A, t a God who loves me so much that he sacrificed his son for me. That's a resolution that is worth fighting after, going for. All the other stuff will kind of fall in place if we just focus on that. And we always give an invitation at the end of the service. And <clears throat> everyone here may be saved, may be born again. That's great. But I always want to give an opportunity if there's anyone here who's not, if there's anyone here who wants to recommit themselves to God, to find a place to start building that commitment. This is a good time to do that also. Of course, you don't have to do it here. You can do it in your prayer time in your time with God. <clears throat> Just be sincere when you start talking about commitment to God. I want to thank you all for being here. I pray that everyone has a very successful and prosperous new year as we go into this year. Remember those who are dealing with loss and Different things at the first of the year, it's a hard time. Just keep them in prayer. Lift them up. I'm going to ask Brother Steve if he'll close us in prayer, and y'all have a, a great week, and come back and be with us on Wednesday night. Brother Steve.